a rapid fire radiographic pathologic correlation review. So rapid fire, I'm just going to sit here and briefly uh, uh, introduce the cases. Our star pathologist, uh, Dr. Yasmin Butt from Arizona, um, Mayo Clinic is up and ready to go. So our goal is to have you leave more confident in looking at these images, reviewing these reports, talking with colleagues at Tumor Board and other conferences, and then certainly when you sit for your ABIM uh, certification or recertification. And our method is uh, kind of straightforward. We're going to activate you with an audience response question, show you a single slice of an x-ray, quick flash of pathology, just so you have to make a commitment, and then go through the pathologic uh, differential diagnosis. These cases have all been, they're all real cases submitted over the years by the CHEST Training and Transitions Committee. And then for reinforcement, uh, everyone leaves today with this digital goodie bag, a quiz you can give yourself at home, and a few uh, CHEST article PDFs that uh, have some nice summaries. Sound okay? So sound reasonable? Um, and here's the ABIM uh, blueprint, if you haven't seen it. When you take a diffuse and obstructive lung disease, throw in cancer and infection, that's approaching you know, more than 40% of the test, uh, 80 questions. All of these lend themselves to pathology items, um, and uh, we're going to go through uh, this core set. Now, when you take the boards these days, I don't know if you've done it, but you have up-to-date, you have internet resources, you know, which can help. That doesn't help you for pathology. You know, there's no reverse image search yet, although Google's trying to work on it. Uh, right now, you just need to review those keywords, those classic images, and Dr. Budd is going to take us uh, through uh, that. Um, let's see, let's see. And I did want to mention the app. Uh, maybe by now, many of you are familiar with it. It's not that intuitive. If you open the session, um, in the session description at the bottom, there's the word more. You have to click on more, and then that gets you to the uh, audience response. You're also welcome, if you're confident, to shout out uh, the answers verbally, and we'll try to work uh, through that. Well, let's dive in. So, uh, your colleague asked you to look over their shoulder uh, at the microscope. 64-year-old patient, chronic dyspnea, some interstitial infiltrates, undergoes a transbronchial biopsy. You see some, you know, clearly some basal and peripheral uh, opacities uh, there. And we're going to go through just uh, some specimens. All right. And taking a look at that, you know, preliminarily, what would you recommend? Anticoagulation, diuretics, no treatment, a repeat biopsy, or steroids? And I think you can advance. Give a few seconds to answer. We've kept your answer period pretty short since we have a lot of slides to show you today. All right. All right. Shall I take Please, a Please, yeah. Okay. So we have a variety of different uh, options here. Looks like most people pick steroids, some say no therapy, and some say repeat biopsy. So let's take a look again at what we have here. All right. So this is a low power showing you the entire biopsy. There's that first piece. You know, you can see that there's some open alveolar spaces, easier alveolar septa, maybe a macrophage, but really not much in the way of interstitial inflammation, no fibrosis, no giant cells, no granulomas, really not seeing anything there. Here's this other piece. You might think there's a little something here, but that's actually just a bit of crush from when the biopsy was actually taken. A little bit of calcification in this cartilage and this uh, piece of bronchial mucosa. You can see that with age, but really no pathologic findings. So there's actually nothing here. So Dr. This, Bhatt, that, so you showed normal lung? Mm -hmm. All right, that's the only trick question for today. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. We wanted to e ease you into this. So this is normal lung, nothing here. Um, so really what you would need is a repeat biopsy if you needed a, a histologic answer uh, for what was going on with that patient. So I'm going to ease you into abnormal lung here with uh, an example of central lobular emphysema. So of course, this is not something that you would take a biopsy to get a diagnosis for, but just to start off a little easy. Um, so you can see here a pulmonary artery here, so this would be our bronchovascular bundle, the airways out of the plane, and some open spaces uh, that are a little bit more open than they should be, so that's central lobular emphysema. Here's another example showing you that as well. You can see some of these septa look like they're sort of broken apart, almost look like they're floating in spaces. This is what uh, emphysema would look like on a wedge biopsy. 
Another example of slightly abnormal uh, that we wouldn't biopsy for is chronic uh, bronchitis. You can see a little bit of smooth muscle hyperplasia. Here's your respiratory, bron uh, respiratory mucosa on the top, and then some uh, seromucinous glands here and a little bit of cartilage. Looks a little thickened, a little bit of chronic inflammation. Uh, if you're interested in the background of how you officially decide something is um, uh, inflamed or not, you can look at the read index, which looks at that uh, variation between the thickness of um, the levels of the submucosa. All right, so now we've eased you in. You've seen some pathology pictures. We're going to go right into case two. All right, 60-year-old, uh, AML a few weeks into chemotherapy, kind of a dark uh, sputum, some chest discomfort, undergoes biopsy. Quick glance at the x-ray. You see this uh, peripheral lesion, concern of a, a elevated hemidiaphragm, uh, ipsilateral pleural fusion maybe. We'll go to the CT. CT confirms this kind of cavitary area, uh, central lucency, um, and a biopsy is performed. So you're suspicious for infection. Which infection do you think it is? Actino, aspergillus, blasto, uh, invasive candida, or mucor? All right, so it looks like we have a majority uh, guessing aspergill uh, aspergillus on this one, or maybe not guessing, correctly identifying um, aspergillosis. <laughs> so you guys got that one, that's great. Uh, and then the next one is mucor. So that is an excellent differential. So this is in indeed um, aspergillus. So here is a section from a wedge of a patient with uh, invasive aspergillus infection. So this is a large airway. You can tell because you have the cartilage uh, here in the wall. And then when you go a little bit higher power, you can see that cartilage there, and you can start to see these septa, uh, set, see these hyphae uh, eating into the cartilage. Here's a small bronchial, completely destroyed. You can't even tell it's a bronchial. Just take my word on it. Uh, destroyed by all of this fungus. So we know this is likely aspergillus in this particular case based off of the fact that it's septated. So you can see that there's septa here. And then also you have this 45 degree angle branch. So those are your sort of key, key buzzwords if you're thinking about aspergillus. All right, and here's an example from that same case showing you a pulmonary artery. So this empty space here is a pulmonary artery, and the aspergillus is eating into it. So this is angioinvasive aspergillosis. All right, now, how you would know for sure it was aspergillus is if you actually saw fruiting heads. You didn't see this in this particular case. This is the GMS. When you see these fruiting heads, you can definitively say just based off of histology that it's aspergillus. There are other uh, fungi that will look like this with a 45 degree angle branching, but the most common, of course, is aspergillus. Now, this is an example of mucor mycosis. So you can see right off the bat, this is an H&E. Um, you don't even need special stains to tell uh, that this is mucor or at least a zygomite. See how these, um, you don't really see septa. Technically, you can see a few, so they're posse septate, but you really shouldn't see very many. And they have this broad ribbon-like architecture. All right, here's another picture. So when you start to see those empty spaces, these very broad ribbon-like, almost like kind of like a twisted ribbon, think about mucor mycosis. All right. Moving right along, so this is a H&E example um, showing you uh, spaghetti and meatballs in the inset here. So this is actually a candida infection, uh, not something we often see on biopsy, but certainly you can see it. Here's an example of a necrotizing pneumonia. And then when we look at our GMS, our silver stain, you see these sort of tangled small nests, and this is an example of nocardia. Okay, so for those of you that like charts, I do have charts. Um, we have some charts sprinkled in here. So these are all the stains that I'll be showing you for special stains. So GMS is, of course, our silver stain. So that usually will give you the brown look, or sorry, the, the, the blackish uh, silvery, silvery look on the green background. Occasionally you can have a pink background depending on the counter stain. Tissue gram stain, of course, for bacteria. PAS, you can also use for fungus. That will be pink on pink. And then the Zeal Nielsen, uh, which is that blue background with the pink for mycobacteria, or, or, or amine rhodamine, which is immunofluorescence, or a modified fight stain. And then you can see what those will stain on the right-hand side. All right, so these are some of the fungi we talked about. For those of you that like charts, all the same uh, answers. You know, thin septated hyphae, 45 degree angle branching for aspergillus. And remember for aspergillus, you can have multiple different types of infection. So you can have vascular tissue invasion with associated infarctions like we just looked at, or you can have an aspergilloma where you have that fungus ball um, in a pre-created cavitary lesion. So it's not necessarily destroying the tissue, it's just maybe you have a cavitary lesion from a pneumonia or a cancer or something like that, and the fungus just moves in and grows in that open space, or you can have ABPA. 
Mucormycosis gives you those wide, um, non or posse septated twisted ribbon look, and then candidiasis, you get that spaghetti and meatballs, yeast, and pseudohyphae. So right. aspergillus, 45 degrees mm -hmm. with the septae, yep. kind of like the letter A itself, would you say? Yeah, kind of like an A, exactly, right. yeah, that's, I we'll, like that. We'll leave it to the expert pathologist. <laughs> and I see some of you taking pictures, you're welcome to do that. But again, you're going to leave with all these beautiful images for your own personal use. PDF. Don't, don't, make, it, don't make a uh, textbook out of it, uh, Dr. Budd already did that, but <laughs> you'll, you'll have all the pictures. All right, next case. All right. 76, uh, kind of progressive dyspnea. Uh, cough, really copious, clear sputum, and she comes to you for advice, and we'll show really dramatic uh, plain film, CT correlate, and you see the chest tube uh, from her uh, biopsy that she ended up having. All right. So is this cough, uh, some kind of lipoid pneumonia from aspiration? Uh, cancer, is it PAM or is it PAP? how it turns red for the last five seconds. Mm. <laughs> All right, so right. nice spread of answers. So certainly uh, we'll be learning a lot here. Uh, so we have lipoid pneumonia versus mucinous adenocarcinoma versus PAP as our uh, top, top answers. So this is actually an example of mucinous adenocarcinoma. So here's a low power image of a wedge uh, from this particular patient. And you can see that there are two foci of something that looks a little abnormal. And then the spaces are filled with this mucinous material. So if we look a little bit higher power, you see these tufts of cells, apical mucin, and then again, mucin in the alveolar spaces, very small bland nuclei. It looks kind of almost benign, except it's not. Um, so this is an example of mucinous adenocarcinoma. So this is actually quite characteristic of this adenocarcinoma, and it's not uncommon. It grows uh, via spread through air spaces, so you can see multiple foci. Uh, you can see these very bland, they look bland cytologically, but they behave quite malignantly, and oftentimes can mimic a pneumonia on imaging. All right, here's another example showing invasion with some desmoplastic stroma. All right, so again, not something you want to miss. Uh, oftentimes, it's a surprise on biopsy because of that white-out look that you see sometimes on imaging with the way it grows. So let's talk about more garden-variety adenocarcinoma, non-small cell carcinoma um, that you're likely to see. Mucinous is, thankfully, a little bit rarer. So there are five histologic subtypes. You're not going to have to be able to recognize specific histologic subtypes, but you will see them on your report, so I just wanted to briefly go over them. So first up is lipidic. So this is where you have what cancer cells, what uh, lining, what look like relatively normal alveolar septa. So these are are going to be your ground glass correlates. Okay, here's lipidic. You can see the cancer cells sort of lining, almost like uh, little butterflies on a wire is sometimes how they describe them, lining your alveolar septa. Okay, and then um, lipidic pattern can be adenocarcinoma in situ if it's less than three centimeters and it's just pure lipidic pattern. All right, there's a little bit higher power showing you that same lipidic look. You can have minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. And again, with lung cancer staging, it all comes down to size. So this is five millimeters or less of invasive patterns uh, with the rest being lipidic and overall less than three centimeters, which leads me into what's an invasive pattern. All right, adenocarcinoma acinar subtype is probably gonna be one of your most common. So this is glands basically. So you'll see these dark purple looking uh, circles embedded in the background of a stroma. Here's a little bit higher power picture showing you that. So this is acinar subtype. You can have papillary. We have these fibrovascular cores. So blood vessels uh, in the center of these little papillary tufts with your malignant cells on the outside. And then micropapillary subtype. So these can actually show a bunch of different looks. I'm gonna show you the most common, which is these little floret of cells floating in spaces. So micropapillary and solid will also will give you a worse disease prognosis and disease-free survival. So when you see these subtypes um, on your report, it probably is not good for your patient. Uh, micropapillary is also more likely to spread through air spaces, just like the mucinous did. And so if you have a wedge resection on these patients, they're slightly more likely to have recurrence depending on how close that margin was. All right, and they're solid, just solid sheet of cells. Okay, right there in the center, some inflammation around it. All right, so you might ask me, what about BAC? I hear about BAC. You know, we talked about lipidic adenocarcinoma, and you think, okay, BAC is, you know, correlate for ground glass, and it's still in the literature. Well, BAC now refers to lipidic predominant adenocarcinoma, mucinous adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma in situ, minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, in situ mucinous adenocarcinoma. So maybe don't use the term BAC anymore because the range of entities that actually used to be called BAC range from 
very good, likely low stage, patient's going to do great, to they're probably going to die maybe in six months or a year. So I think BAC is an outdated term. Please don't use it. Okay. So uh, last bit of conventional adenocarcinoma that I wanted to show you. This is a needle core biopsy. And, you know, we talk about these patterns and say, okay, well, why are they important? Um, on the left, you see acinar. So these, there are these glands with the desmoplastic stroma. And on the right, you see what is actually micropapillary. And I, bring this, and I show this case because micropapillary can show up as ground glass on imaging because it gets these individual cells. And so you might think you're biopsying a ground glass lesion. Oh, it's going to be lipidic. And then it comes back as actually high grade. And you say, how can it be high grade? It's because it's micropapillary pattern. Okay, so again, for the charts, this is a common IHC for lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, coarse TTF1 napsin A, CK7, squamous cell carcinoma, so your other non-small cell. Uh, P40 is the most sensitive and specific marker, but uh, you'll still see P63 and CK56 used. And then small cell carcinoma, which we'll show you an example of later, can also be TTF1 positive, and then synaptochrome or your neuroendocrine marker. So you'll be seeing these markers in the reports. A couple pitfalls I'd like to point out, P63, which is why I don't like to use it, can stain up to 25% of lung adenocarcinomas. And then neuroendocrine markers, in the absence of neuroendocrine morphologic features, really don't mean anything. So your pathologist should not be just routinely staining synapto and chroma on every lung cancer biopsy that comes across their desk. All right, so you know we started out with the mucinous adenocarcinoma. Here are some markers for that. Probably don't take a picture of this because what I want you to take away from this is that it's not really an IHC game. You can have CK7 positive negative, CK20 positive negative, TTF1 positive negative. You can even have CDX2, which is a GI marker positive negative. So basically, mucinous adenocarcinomas kind of do whatever they want. So when I get these cases, I don't sign them out with stains. I just say it's a mucinous adenocarcinoma, and you have to look at the imaging. You know, do they have a big mass in their stomach? Do they have something in their pancreas? All right. Can you go back to yeah, uh, Dr. Park real quick? All right. This is my last one, I promise. One more? This one? Okay. So squamous yeah. cell, the Q in squamous is like a backwards P, right? So squamous P40. Oh, I no? Like that. <laughs> All right, you won't forget it. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Yeah, and it's bolded for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, next case, a uh, young person, uh, chest pains, dyspnea, cough, uh, abnormal imaging. And you perform, uh, we say TBNA, but they've had some other testing done as well. Let's take a look. So clearly a superior mediastinal uh, widening and abnormality. And we'll give you a single slice from a CT uh, showing... Uh, non-contrast filled uh, lesion there. I'll give you a little bonus info before the question. So do you want antifungals? Uh, you're concerned about HP, so you talk about birds. Rule out TB and step back from the patient. You're going to do a PET scan and look for a hematologic malignancy or uh, steroids again. And just like the boards, you don't have a lot of time to think. They, they go quickly. Okay. Rapid fire. Okay. All right. So it looks like most people I want either want to give steroids or do a PET scan and a bone marrow biopsy. Okay. So steroids is the answer here. So does anyone know what it is? You want to yell it out? What, what you think this mm -hmm. is? Sarcoid, Great. yeah, exactly. So your stains were negative. You have this lymphangitic distribution of granulomas. Um, this is a very generous uh, biopsy. Um, you can see here's, here's a uh, profiles of pulmonary arteries. So this is your bronchovascular bundle, and then it's kind of running along interlobular septa there. And there's really no interstitial pneumonia. So what I mean by that is the background um, uh, septa, you can see here, are very, very bland. There's not a lot of robust inflammation. I'm not seeing organizing pneumonia, acute lung injury, nothing else is going on. So sarcoidosis, and of course, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. And we are always, always going to do special stains on these. And also, you should do culture uh, on these as well to increase your diagnostic yield. It's important to do both. All right. So moving on, so we're talking about granulomas. What other kind of granulomas can you see? Necrotizing. So the granulomas here were not necrotizing. So anytime you see granulomas in a report, you want to know are they necrotizing or they're not necrotizing. So when you have necrotizing granulomas, infection jumps to the top of your list, and it's one, two, and three. Uh, this was a case of mycobacteria, uh, tuberculosis. Here's that Zeal Nielsen stain that I talked about earlier. So you have that nice blue background, um, and you have the the pink uh, uh, bacteria there. So these are acid fast bacilli. Uh, this is probably what you'll see on your boards if you see an example of this. Uh, this is a control tissue. The reality is, is we spend 10 to 15 minutes on high power looking for the one mycobacteria mm. floating. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is an example of oramine rhodamine. So this is that immunofluorescent stain. It's a really nice stain if you have um, it as an option. 
So other uh, granulomas you can see, HP is a big one that jumps up. So these granulomas, they're circled here for you, are very different than granulomas for TB or granulomas for sarcoid. They're loosely formed. They're also non-necrotizing like the sarcoidal granulomas, but unlike the sarcoidal granulomas, they're very loosely formed. They're not that tightly formed. You'll see them in the air spaces, often with giant cells. All right, just, just bare collection of epithelioid histiocytes and lymphocytes. Here's another example right here in the center. That's a granuloma. All right. All right, case five. 74-year-old smoker, uh, some systemic uh, complaints, fatigue, aortic stenosis, some joint issues, uh, has this concerning pedavid nodule that ends up getting resected. Right midlung of, on plain film, you see the CT correlate there, kind of a cavitary uh, concerning nodule. She's had a cup, she has more than one. So stands are negative. No mycobacteria or fungus in this one. This is a granulomatous a polyangitis, a lymphomatoid granulomatosis, a necrotizing sarcoid, a room nodule, or squamous cell malignancy. So we have a split between GPA and rheumatoid nodule, which I think is a very reasonable right. thing to consider, and lymphomatoid granulomatosis, which has the word granuloma uh, in it, and then a very small percentage thinks necrotizing sarcoid and then squam. Okay, so this is actually an example of a rheumatoid nodule. And I think that ruling out GPA is a reasonable differential here. So Necrotizing sarcoidosis, exceedingly unusual, exceedingly rare. Some people believe it may not even exist. I'm one of those people. Um, but you would want to see a vasculitis as well um, to think, even think about uh, necrotizing sarcoid. Um, LYG doesn't actually really show you this type of necrosis, despite the name, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, there's no malignant cells here. It's just all necrosis and lymphocytes and a rare giant cell right there, if you, if you caught it. Um, and then um, sarc and, uh, rheumatoid is sort of what you're left with, so it's a little bit of a diagnosis of exclusion. So here's an example of LYG, which is a lymphoproliferative disorder where you get destruction of um, uh, vessels, and it's EBV positive, so it's a, a virus-driven process. Here's an example of what you might see in GPA. So you see how this looks fairly similar to what we saw before. The difference being is you have basophilic necrosis, which means it's blue. And that's because of all the neutrophils. Um, and then there's an example of a, a Wagner's giant cell up in the corner. And remember GPA, think about C. anca. All right. There's another example showing you this, these neutrophilic microapsises. Again, those neutrophils is what drives that basophilic necrosis. As they die, they look blue. All right, and then here's segmental vasculitis. All right, this is very characteristic of GPA. So this is a pulmonary artery, and you can see the top part of the artery looks essentially completely normal. And then you see this part of the artery is completely destroyed. If I just showed you a tight view of that, you wouldn't even realize you were looking at an artery. A lot of inflammation. So that segmental vasculitis is extremely distinctive for GPA. You can also see it in eGPA. Here's an example showing you an eosinophilic microabscess. So eGPA can look very similar to GPA, except you're going to see lots and lots of eosinophils. And remember, with eGPA, PA, you'll often see uh, P. anca in your ser serologic studies. Something I want to point out also is that GPA and eGPA can actually be ANCA negative. Um, I've had cases where they're extremely distinctive, beautiful on histology, and, like, and I'm told, well, but the ANCAs are negative. And it's like, that's okay. You can have negative cases, especially with eGPA, maybe negative for ANCA studies. All right, and here's uh, just that gross example of lymphomatoid uh, granulomatosis, which, again, it can look quite like any other granuloma. And here's um, destruction of an airway of um, LYG. Again, LYG, extremely rare. Okay, rounding the corner. 59-year-old, HIV positive, also a smoker. Kind of insidious uh, dyspnea, a nonproductive cough. Refer to you. In addition to the enlarged cardiac silhouette, you see these kind of peripheral interstitial changes. And here's a single slice, a CT correlate, showing his abnormal parenchyma. All right. So you know it's abnormal, is it COP? Uh, DIP, LIP, NSIP, or UIP.
All right, so it looks like almost half of you think this is LIP. Next up is NSIP. Um, oh no, COP followed by NSIP. All right, I circled the fibroblast focus and I think I led some of you astray. Okay, so this is actually an example of UIP or IPF. So let's go over what we see. So this is a wedge biopsy. This is a little bit of a low power. Now key features you wanna look at in order to identify a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern of fibrosis is a couple of things. So we have an abrupt transition between the areas that look abnormal. So you can see this is all pink and fibrotic on the left. And then here you can see recognizable alveolar septa. So it's pretty abrupt. You can just kind of draw a line right here. All right, so that's what we call our spatial heterogeneity. And the next thing we talk about is um, temporal heterogeneity. And so what that refers to is the juxtaposition of older fibrosis, which is collagen. So that's that really pink stuff, which is the collagen fibrosis. And then the newer fibrosis, with this, which is your fibroblast foci, which is this. And so fibroblast foci you see as these sort of mixoid or AKA sort of light blue looking uh, material with these spindled cells. And they're gonna be in the interstitium at that junction. Uh, between the abnormal and the normal. Now this looks very much like cryptogenic organizing pneumonia would. The difference is, is it's in the interstitium versus organizing pneumonia is gonna be in the airway. So mm -hmm. see there's some macrophages over here, that's where you're gonna see the airways. So those are your Masson bodies or fibroblast plugs in contrast to the fibroblast foci that you see in the interstitium um, in a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern of fibrosis. All right, so those are your fibroblast foci, all right. And then the other change we see here is microscopic honeycomb change. So this is when you have these abnormal spaces that are lined by respiratory epithelium. So this is your respiratory epithelium. Um, maybe you can make out a few little fuzzy border there. There's your cilia, all right? And they're abnormal. This doesn't look like a simple normal bronchovascular bundle, right? Like here's a pulmonary artery and maybe that's its paired airway, but what about the rest? So you see these abnormal um, shapes and they're going to be surrounded by fibrosis, like in this example. So that's microscopic honeycomb change. And oftentimes you'll see some mucus um, uh, stuck in them as well. So that's what you'll see on imaging as those stacked cysts, typically in the lower lobes in the basilar uh, regions. Okay, so let's go to NSIP. So NSIP, so that's non-specific interstitial pneumonia. I, I feel like I need to apologize for the terminology because it's terrible, even though I, I didn't make it. But mm -hmm. so NSIP is when you have homogenous, relatively homogenous thickening. So in contrast to the UIP pattern that we looked before, this kind of all looks the same. You know, from pleura to pleura, there's this sort of homogenous thickening of the septa. So that's gonna be NSIP. Now this is a really severe example of fibrotic NSIP. NSIP can also be cellular or you Usually we see more of a mixture between cellular and fibrotic. But when, you, when, they, when they want you to say the answer is an SIP, it should all kind of look the same. In contrast to this, where it looks different. You can see there's quite a bit of variability in the amount of fibrosis compared to normal looking areas. You shouldn't see that. Okay, so here is just an example of some of the histologic features and then UIP versus NSIP. So the collagen fibrosis should be subpleural and then it goes along the paraseptal area, okay? And then we call those, so you see how it's kind of subpleural here and kind of going in, along the paraseptal areas. It looks like a donut. So always think about UIP with like, look for the fibrotic donuts. And then you have the normal lung on the inside as the whole of the donut, all right? And then those fibroblast foci are gonna be characteristic of a UIP pattern. The reality is, is you can see them in NSIP, but if they show you a fibroblast foci on your boards or think about, think about UIP pattern. Organizing pneumonia, you shouldn't see it in UIP um, unless you have acute exacerbation or something superimposed on top of your UIP um, and you can see it in NSIP sometimes, all right? Honeycombing, think about UIP. The reality is you see it in NSIP, especially as they get end stage, but for testing purposes, they should be rare or not present. And then, of course, hyaline membranes, which you see in diffuse alveolar damage, you're gonna not see those in either of these fibrotic processes unless they have an acute exacerbation. Okay, so here's an example of lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. So I hope you can see how this looks a little different than that UIP. So you can kind of make out where the septa are. They're very thickened, but they're filled by lymphocytes. It's really, really blue. So if you have a case where you're thinking about UIP, you really shouldn't be seeing much blue. You should be seeing a lot of pink for the collagen fibrosis and then those donuts of fibrosis that I told you about and then maybe a fibroblast foci. For LIP, you wanna see lots and lots of blue. It should be the point where you're thinking, gosh, could this be a lymphoma, all right? And then here's an example of organizing pneumonia. So you can see that these, these, this material looks essentially identical to that fibroblast foci I showed you. However, it's actually floating in the alveolar space. 
All right, so it's floating in the alveolar space here. All right, so those are the, the fibroblast plugs, and those are plugging um, uh, in the alveolar spaces. This patient was also a smoker. There's a lot of um, pigment and macrophages in the background, but this is organizing pneumonia, and that's how you tell the difference is where the myxoid plugs are actually are located. Okay. So talking about smoking, this is an example of a patient with RBILD. Now, of course, that's a clinical pathologic diagnosis, but on uh, histology, we'll see those uh, pigmented macrophages, which will show you a high power of in a moment. And then this kind of little bit of uh, fibrosis, it's kind of a very hyalinized pink fibrosis. So you're still seeing pink, but it's, it's a much brighter pink. Um, and you'll see smoking-related changes in association with it. So here's some respiratory bronchiolitis. You see the septa are kind of normal appearing. This is a little emphysematous, hard to tell because they're kind of close, but trust me, it is. Uh, and then you see these pigmented macrophages, and they start around the airways and then move outward. So they have this very fine, light brown pigment, oftentimes with these little black anthracotic flecks. So those are those pigmented macrophages of respiratory bronchiolitis. Well, thanks, Dr. Bott. And if it's uh, Sjogren's or HIV in the stem, that might lead you to LIP, but occasionally exactly. they will flip the path on you just to make sure that you're paying attention. K7, uh, again, another young patient, a stem cell transplant recipient, uh, not doing well cough, a dyspnea, febrile, and has a lavage uh, looking for infection. Really diffuse infiltrates, uh, both uh, on plain film and CT. Could this be CMV, blasto, histo, paragonimus, uh, or PJP? Vast majority think it's PJP. A few more thinking about CMV. All right, so you guys mostly got it. This is PJP. You can see little dots in there. And then we're going to switch to our next presentation. The files were big enough that they did not cooperate with one file. That's right. Too many uh, high, <laughs> Too many high resolution, images. beautiful pictures. I, I broke the system. <laughs> And for those who put CMV, certainly you can get co-infection. Usually in the stem, they would give you a relapse or partial response to PJP and, and, therapy. Yeah, exactly. And I'll show you a photo of CMV in a minute. <clears throat> but definitely with CMV, you'll see viral inclusions in both the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Um, so these are the stains. Uh, these are cytologic preparations. The so pap stain on the left and a diff quick uh, stain on the right. I don't think they're going to ever ask you to differentiate between. But basically, you look for this little central dot, and that's your clue that you're looking at pneumocystis. So here's what it would look like in a biopsy. Um, so clearly, there's uh, some uh, reactive type to pneumocyte hyperplasia in the background, some chronic inflammation. But the key unique feature here is are these fluffy pink infiltrates. It looks like cotton candy, and that is super, super classic um, for pneumocystis. And you can see a GMS stain in the bottom right um, uh, showing you what that pneumocystis would look like. And here is, again, a little bit more um, showing you the pneumocystis. They look like crushed ping pong balls on histology. So if you're looking at a cytologic preparation, you look for the little central dot. Uh, that's a little bit harder to see on histology, so you look for those crushed ping pong balls, and you look for fluffy pink material. That, whenever I see this material, I'm like, oh yeah, this is going to be pneumocystis, and it almost always is. Okay, so let's move on to another option. So this is an example of disseminated histoplasmosis. And I say it's disseminated because if you look at the inset here, this is a macrophage, and it's filled with all of these tiny little yeast forms. And when you see intracytoplasmic histoplasmosis, you know that it's a disseminated case. All right, and here it is showing on a pap smear. You can see all of these probably like 200 yeast forms inside this single cell. Now you should contrast that versus an old hyalinized granuloma, okay? So these are some giant cells and some histiocytes and then this kind of like old hyalinized pink material in the center and then we found some histo. Those two things are very different clinically. Um, it's not uncommon to find old histo, depending on where a patient's from. I'm from Texas originally. We saw histo constantly, um, old granulomas here and there and a little bit of histo. You don't need to treat those patients versus if you're seeing disseminated histoplasmosis, you're probably going to need to treat those patients. Um, so when the, where the histo is is important. And so if you don't get that information, you can always ask your pathologist, hey, was this like an old granuloma or does it look like a disseminated case? All right. So um, this shows you narrow base budding. 
Um, so again, this goes back to like any time you're looking at fungus, they want to know like, is it does it bud, does it not bud? So histoplasmosis, they're all really small. They've been described as little puffed rice grains, and I'll have a chart here in a little while um, for those of you that like the charts. And little puffed rice grains and narrow base budding for histoplasmosis. So next up is blastomyces. So again, it just depends on where you live, uh, what you're going to see most commonly. This is a pap stain and a diff quick. So blastomyces um, has broad base budding, all right, and this kind of double refractile look to the outside of the yeast, all right? Again, GMS, I have a couple of different um, pictures, so hopefully when whatever picture you might see, you'll be ready to see it, uh, ready to identify it. So there's, a, again, that broad base budding in contrast to histo, which gives you narrow base budding, and they're very, very small. Blasto is larger. Okay, so again, another case of uh, blasto with some necrosis, necrotizing granuloma, broad base budding. You can see this actually quite easily on the H&E. All right, so here's an example of coccidioides. This is very low power, showing you a necrotizing granuloma in a wedge. Okay, mm. this is our intro picture. This is actually from the blood of a transbronchial biopsy. This was in the blood right outside of it. And you can see you have this thick wall spherule, and then there's little endospores that spill out. This is very, very specific for coccidioides. And if they want you to identify coccidioides, hopefully they should show you this picture. A thick-walled spherule with endospores uh, spilling out of it. Here it is on silver stain. Again, you can see this one's partially burst open. Here, this one, they're spilling out. Gorgeous. All right, so if you see this, coccidioides. Okay, so cryptococcus, this is a low power of this uh, necrotizing granulomatous uh, nodule. And even on this power, you can start to see there's these little dots with little halos around them. You're like, what's going on? It doesn't project quite as well up here as it does on the screen. But here is a higher power image. You can see these halos. And it's actually um, an artifact of processing, but when you see those halos around that, think about cryptococcus. All right, and again, there it is on uh, GMS stain. Cryptococcus is uh, variably sized. All right, and they have narrow base budding. So again, histo had narrow base budding. Crypto also has narrow base budding, but is variably sized and is gonna be much larger than histo, which has these kind of small little puffed rice grain looks. All right, and so those are all the characteristics of the uh, fungi I just showed you. So again, I bolded, I think, what are some of the, the good uh, terms, the, <laughs> the buzzwords that people use. Okay, so these are a couple examples of distinctive viral inclusions. Unfortunately, a vast majority of virus, viruses don't give us distinctive inclusions where we can say, ah, oh, we know what the answer is. You have to defer to culture or serologies. Um, CMV in the upper left, all right? So again, CMV, think about, you know, they talk about the owl's eyes. Um, you'll see uh, inclusions in the nucleus as well as inclusions in the cytoplasm. Um, HSB and adeno, you wouldn't have to differentiate between the two, but you get this sort of smudgy look um, to, the, to the nucleus, all right? And then measles, you get this distinctive Worth and Finkelty-like cell that looks like a giant cell, but probably they wouldn't ask you these, but CMV, I think, is probably fair game for reports. All right, and then things that look funny, we're gonna make a, a jump over to liver flukes or to lung flukes, all right? So here you can see an abnormal, abnormal structure here. Oftentimes you'll see these in granulomatous inflammation. Patient might have peripheral eosinophilia. Is another example. All right, here's an example of diarophilaria, so heartworm. So we're a dead end host for these guys. These show up often as coin lesions incidentally discovered on imaging. So when a patient has a dog with heartworms, they get bit by the mosquito, then they get bit by the mosquito, and the, the worm causes little filarial forms that then get trapped in your lungs. All right, and then some gram stains. Promise to show you a picture of, of all the special stains. So these are gram positive cocci, they're purple for gram positive, and then gram negative. All right, these say cocci, but they are not. Those should be bacilli. I'll fix that for the next iteration of this. All right. Well, Dr. Bud, thank you. So uh, blastomycosis is easy, letter B, broad-based bud. That's great. Exactly. I have trouble with histo and PCP. You can't use the size difference because they're mm -hmm. not side by side on the image. Ah. Would you say that the Histo has the budding and PCP won't be budding, or do you have any tricks to distinguish yeah. that? Yeah, so I think the good trick is that as with histo, they're gonna have that little puffed rice look and you might see the budding. You shouldn't see the budding um, in pneumocystis, and pneumocystis looks like a crushed ping pong. So they'll have, sometimes it look like little like um, oval shapes, or you actually, depending on what you're looking for, you'll see that. And then the little dots can be hard to differentiate depending on, on your cytology specimen. So hopefully they'll give you a GMS if they want you to tell the difference. Got it. Yeah. Case uh, eight, so two more to go, and then we have some uh, quiz at the end. So case eight, 35-year-old, uh, insidious dyspnea, uh, PFT show significant obstruction, uh, and this is pursued. Uh, you might not need to do a biopsy for this case, but one was performed. Clearly diffuse uh, cysts, very concerning diffuse process. And there's the pathologic specimen.
this a high power of uh, this little spot? So, second order question. They want you to know the diagnosis, but with that diagnosis, will there be a low uh, A1AT level? Is this a steroid responsive process? Will the sweat chloride be elevated? Uh, or will this stain uh, with pathology be positive for HMB45 uh, or S100? This might be our hardest question. <laughs> You guys are awesome. All right, so <laughs> tissue will stain with HMV45. All right, so this is an example of LAM. Um, and you can see that those are those spindled cells in the wall of these uh, cysts here. And they stain with HMV45. Reason being for that, LAM has an interesting myomelanocytic phenotype. So it will stain with muscle stains and it will also stain with melanoma stains, of which HMV45 is. All right, so there's smooth muscle actin in the background and then HMV45. Okay, so the differential would be PLCH. You have cystic lung disease, and you might see some cells. Um, now, it's interesting because in LAM, you actually have these cysts with, with the cells of interest in the walls of the cyst. Versus in PLCH, when we look at histology, it's really the cellular nodule that's causing retraction of the surrounding lung, which gives that cyst-like look on imaging, which is actually a little bit harder to appreciate on actual histology. So here's a high power showing you a mixture of a couple of different types of cells. In a PLCH case, you can see some pigmented macrophages. Um, you can see a mixture of plasma cells, lymphocytes. I think there's probably eosinophil in there. And then these little oblong um, cells which often have these uh, little grooves in them, the Langerhans cells themselves, and those would stain with CD1A. They also stain with S100, which we had in the question. So S100 and CD1A will stain your Langerhans cells. All right. Here's another example, higher power, showing you those cells with a little, with a little groove nucleus. So those are your Langerhans cells. And then these are your smoker's macrophages. All right. Okay. And for that one, would, uh, for this case, uh, would people have stopped with a serum VEGF that was abnormal or gone on to do a biopsy because she was so young? Maybe serum? Okay. Well, got it. And Dr. Butt, we're doing great on time, so thank you again. Yeah. Uh, case nine, uh, another lung nodule. This is picked up on uh, cancer screening. Pretty good size, but it is smooth, smooth uh, edges. Again, these are all real uh, cases, real patients, and we're going to flash the pathology there. Is this an adenocarcinoma, an atypical carcinoid, a malt lymphoma, small cell, or a fibrous tumor? All right, we have a spread here. Nobody thinks it's adenocarcinoma, excellent. Um, a lot of people think it's atypical carcinoid. It's reasonable to put it in the differential versus a malt lymphoma, also reasonable. And then small number of people think it's small cell and then a few thinks it's SFT. So this is actually an example of small cell carcinoma. So let's go over why. So small cell carcinoma has very distinctive morphology, blue. Basically, think about blue. So it's it's essentially all nucleus. There's just very, very little cytoplasm. It's very hard to see. There's maybe a tiny little spread of cytoplasm around it. So that's when you should start thinking about small cell carcinoma. Um, I always tell pathology residents, if you could only do one stain, what would you do here? And it would be a CD45 to look for a lymphoma because lymphomas are the other types of cells that often have very, very little cytoplasm and they're all nucleus. All right, uh, you often get molding, so the cells kind of mold to each other, and you can often see crush artifact. There's not as much crush in this particular picture, but those are the features that you look for for small cell carcinoma. Okay, so here's an example of a carcinoid tumor. Mm. So carcinoid tumors, in contrast to small cells, they're going to have more cytoplasm, 
you're going to see more of those characteristic neuroendocrine features, a kind of stippling salt and pepper look uh, in the nuclei. You can see those sometimes in small cell, but usually not as much. Their small cell tends to be more hyperchromatic, so it's not as easy to appreciate those neuroendocrine features. And, and neuroendocrine uh, tumors, uh, the carcinoid tumors, will often form these kind of little packets of cells. Okay, so this is a carcinoid tumor. And then an atypical carcinoid tumor, so typical versus atypical, is based off of the presence of necrosis and mitotic figures. So 2 to 10 mitotic figures gives you an atypical carcinoid tumor diagnosis when you have neuroendocrine morphology. But you can see from this, because uh, I think a lot of people thought this was a, the other, our example was atypical. You see how much more cytoplasm you see? There's more pink around the cells. All right, so this would be uh, atypical carcinoid in contrast to the small cell, where you're going to see mostly blue. So if you see a sheet of blue, the cells look like they're kind of crammed up against each other. Each other, and maybe there's some crush or necrosis. Think about a small cell carcinoma. I know that the location probably was not classic, and so that was a little bit tricky, but the morphology is extremely uh, characteristic, so don't get tripped up um, by sometimes the location might be off. You, they don't always have to be um, centrally located. All right. So then just going back to contrast to the adenocarcinoma, nobody thought it was, which is great. So this is adenocarcinoma. You have those atypical glands. All right. Now, this is an example of a malt lymphoma. So I think this is a very reasonable differential for this because the cells mm. have lots of blue. Now, these are a little bit more rounded. They're not as, you know, you, sometimes you see a little bit more stretched out look to small cell carcinomas. This is actually an airway right here. This is benign, and this is a lymphoepithelial lesion. So these are lymphocytes that are actually destroying this airway. So the lymphocytes themselves don't necessarily look malignant, but what they're doing is malignant. And of course, we have our whole host of stains to diagnose a malt lymphoma. So for a rounded nodule, the, uh, another differential would be a pulmonary hamartoma. Now, of course, on uh, imaging, you'd want to look for you know, fat densities and things like that. Usually, you can identify this on imaging, but occasionally, they come as surprises. So on a little bit higher power, for hamartomas, you'll see a mixture of uh, cartilage here. All right, and then these empty spaces are fat, uh, and then compressed uh, respiratory epithelium. So that's your characteristic features for a pulmonary hamartoma. Now here's a solitary fibrous tumor. Now I have one photo of SFT. SFT can actually have quite a range of histologic findings, which I, histologic looks. I won't show you all the examples, um, but I think this is actually reasonable um, based off of the morphology to consider. However, uh, it's a little, not, it, they're not as crushed together. You don't see molding in SFTs, uh, and you typically see a little bit more uh, cytoplasm here. Okay, and you won't, you shouldn't see necrosis in SF, SFTs. These will be positive for STAT6. That's diagnostic. Um, they'll also be CD34, depending. So you may get a question that asks you, like, oh, it's an SFT, it's CD34 positive. Hopefully, they would tell you STAT6 because that's more sensitive and specific. All right. So here's a chart of high yield IHC uh, that you might get asked about. So you know, we've got what we just talked about: the LAM, the HMB45, melanoma. I'm even taking a picture of this one. <laughs> Um, and then your smooth muscle actin, Desmond would also be positive, SFT, STAT6, CD34. Um, we didn't go over an example of mesothelioma, but uh, maybe in the next iteration we can add that. Uh, but calretinin, WT1, D240, CK56, I think sometimes those stains might come up. And then, of course, adenocarcinoma and squame, which we <clears throat> talked about already. Okay, we have time for our quick... So wait, 10 or 4, why don't we do a few, yeah. and then yeah. we can jump to the bonus bundle. And okay. uh, you just have to make sure we end yeah. on an answer we all get right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So these are quick path reviews, so there's no questions, so you just have to yell out the answers. <laughs> yes, aspergillus, nice. fruiting heads. <laughs> this is, is this spaghetti and meatballs? Spaghetti and meatballs, okay. yes, Canada. Ribbon, good, good. Ribbons, mucormycosis. Yes, thank you. Oh, yes, if people were listening, using a adenocarcinoma. <laughs> mm. All right, angulated glands and a background of desmoplastic stroma look a little hypochromatic. Yes, adenocarcinoma. This is acinar yeah. subtype of adenocarcinoma. Okay. Neck, I heard neck, yes, TB, yes. Necrotizing granuloma, this was TB. Of course, you'd have to look at the stains and or cultures to know for sure. Okay. Yeah, GPA, exactly. Great. You see geographic, basophilic necrosis, giant cells, GPA. See Anka. All right. Yes, UIP, <laughs> excellent. All right, you can see the fibrosis there, and you can see fibroblast foci. All right, UIP. We see plugs of fibroblasts in the alveolar spaces. 
Organizing pneumonia, yes. <laughs> Lamb, yes. You all, you guys got all got this. <laughs> NSIP, excellent. <laughs> Cryptococcus, excellent. Halos, artifacts, okay. Small cell. <laughs> Broad-based blooding, blasto, excellent. PJP, yep. Fluffy pink material, crushed ping pong balls. <laughs> Cotton candy, I love it. Narrow base budding, small, little rice, yes, histo. LIP, exactly. So you have your septa enlarged by lots and lots of lymphocytes. Coxy, yes, spherules with endospores. Thank you, everybody. Amazing. So <laughs> you guys did great. <laughs> so this is uh, so clearly you're, you're you're great. You should be very confident going into your pathology experiences. This is when you want to take your cameras out. QR code jumps to these beautiful pictures. You can quiz yourself later just before boards. Uh, there's a couple of chest articles uh, in there as well. Contact information. Please reach out. Please give us. Uh, uh, feedback. Enjoy the rest of the session, and uh, please once again uh, help me thank our pathologist, uh, Dr. Butt. Have a great uh, rest of your week. Thank you. Any questions, let us know. Otherwise, again, have a great rest of your day. And and after a few minutes, we'll take you to the, you can walk down and around.